I don't like to hear, it's called put your mic on. Um, there's a phrase that people will ask you when they greet you. They'll say, hey, what's new? What's new? If, I don't know, if you're like me, every once in a while somebody will say what's new and I'm like, um, and I feel like I've been put on the spot and I've got to come up with something like novel and exciting that's going on in my life where I'm a loser with nothing going on in my life. We've got a series that we're starting today. It's actually kind of an unseries. It's called just one word. It's just called new, new. What's new? So we're going to talk about what's new for the next number of weeks. It's an unseries because it ends on Easter, and Easter is kind of the the pinnacle of the series because Easter, by the very nature of the resurrection, is actually uh, the active ingredient of all of Christian doctrine. You can take all of the Bible and if you, if you pull out the thread of the resurrection of Jesus, everything falls apart. So that's where we're gonna end. We're kind of building it to Easter Sunday. But the word new, as I'm gonna use it over the next few weeks, um, has some meaning to it. Um, and it, I wanna pull 2 Corinthians 5.17 up on the screen real quick. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. So just put that title slide up there. There it is, yeah. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Now, in the original language, when you were, would read this, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. The old way of reading that, back when some of us who are older than 50 would read it out of the King James, it was, um, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The word creature was actually there. And now he is a new creation, has found its way into some translations, but it just literally means there's no, there's no he is a, or they are, or she is a. It's just if anyone is in Christ, new creation has come. Something new has happened. You've gone, you've kind of gone from uh, death to life. It's gone from empty to full. It's gone from parked and just sitting there to purpose. Actually, there's something that I have to do. I'm not just parked. I'm not just slipped into neutral for an extended period of time. This new creation has come. And it's new in the sense that it's different. And it's not more or less. It could be less because you, you tend to narrow your focus. Your focus when you are in Christ, your focus may narrow. You don't have all these things in front of you anymore. You decide, you begin to prioritize and say, hey, what is my life about? And the Bible and scripture begins to narrow our focus. So in that sense, it could be less. But it's different, not of the same kind, but it's different in the sense it's entirely different kind, as different as life and death are. That's how different it is. So this idea of new creation. Week one, we're gonna be talking about a new purpose, a new purpose. And I wanna take that not from, oh, I came to Christ, therefore now I have a new purpose, but I wanna start all the way back at the beginning and talk about the purpose that we have as people. Because we don't hear this in our culture today. Uh, I did a tour of YouTube this past week. And I went looking for some very specific things. And of course, this is 10 years old, all right? This comment is 10 years old. But the stuff that people are watching bears very little scant, if any, resemblance to what's actually true. Like what's actually true. Have you ever been in part of an event? This morning, a couple of our people were part of a, an accident at 13th and 12th. And uh, they weren't in it, but they were there as it happened and, 
and stayed and, and helped a little bit. Have you ever been part of an, an incident or an experience or an event and then you read about it in the paper afterwards and you're like, oh, that's not right. Oh, that, that's not right. Oh, that did, that's not how it happened. Total mischaracterization. And as, as accurate as reporters try to be, they don't have a, like a 360 view of everything. And invariably, things just aren't true. But it's kind of, you know, our culture has taken that to a whole new level when if you were to say that this is true. And if we are being discipled by all this other stuff, whether we're old fashioned and we watch it on TV, or whether we're watching it on a small screen or a medium sized screen or a bigger screen, if we're being discipled by all of our culture's media, we're not being discipled by this. We're just not. We're just not. So for a few minutes this morning, we're going to rewind back to Genesis chapter 1 just to remind ourselves that it's even there. For us to, for us to step out of our current culture, like for instance, um, what are we, 247 years old as a nation. This July, it'll be 247 years. Let's round it off to 250 years. That's really not that long in the grand scheme of things. If you went to college, you probably took a, a world civilizations course or a Western civilization course, Western Civ, or you took a global studies course of some sort. And you would see the, the ancient civilizations throughout that course that existed way back, way back before the time of Christ, thousands of years ago. We're Johnny come lately, no offense to Johnny, but we're Johnny come lately as a nation and as a culture, 30 years old? The culture we have today, not even that. But we've got a very different culture right now than we had 20 years ago even, even 20 years ago. So let's jump out of that and let's jump back into Genesis chapter one and see that we were created for a purpose because it starts out with in the beginning, in the beginning. There was a beginning, there was a beginning. See, the Bible, the Bible actually helps us to jump out of our culture because in the first two chapters of Genesis, which by the way are interpreted very differently depending on who you read. There are so many different interpretations just of Genesis chapter one and two, but there was a beginning, there was a start. You can go all the way back to a point when there wasn't and then there was. There was that beginning and Genesis one and two, it's like a narrative, it's a story about what that beginning was like or if you read some others, what that beginning um, was literally or was like, or what it might have been like. There's a lot of questions as you read the Bible. There's a lot of nuance. And when you just, if we were to just pull Genesis one and two out and that's all we had, we'd have more questions. But it's helpful when you can read the rest of the Bible. It's helpful when you can read about what Jesus said about Genesis one and two, but that's, that's, that's all for, that's for a different time. Um, but in the beginning, there was a beginning, and in the beginning, Elohim, in the beginning, God, in the beginning, this mighty one, this intelligent being, this, not just this power, or the man upstairs, or Father Time, who we're all mad at this morning, no, it's actually this mighty one, this supreme being, the one who rules. He was in the beginning. God was in the beginning. And then it says that God created. He created. He's a, that's why we call him the creator, that he actually made something with some intention 
and some purpose and some design. Some in the academic world call it the, in, the intelligent designer. We, we, that's an okay description, but there's so much more of a description of who this God is in the scriptures. In fact, it says in Genesis chapter one, it says, and God said, and there was. And God said, and there was. And God said, let there be, easy one, light. And there was light. And then there was a distinction between the darkness and the light. And God said, let the land and the sea be separated. And it was. And there was a distinction between the land and the sea. And you see that as, as God creates day after day, he just speaks it, and it is, and there's often a distinction. The idea of holiness is an idea of being set apart, being unique, being distinct, being created for a purpose, in God's case, uncreated, yet still with a purpose. And you see, as God creates, he creates and there's, there are distinctions. And God said, and there was. And we look at John chapter one, and John, uh, hearkening back to Genesis one, he starts out his gospel and he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. And then you go back to Genesis chapter one, and God spoke, and it was. And he spoke, and it was. Then you go to the New Testament, it says that about Jesus that there was not anything made that wasn't made by him. And you start connecting, hyperlinking all of these statements throughout the scripture, and it begins to build this tapestry of truth, this beautiful tapestry of truth, of this God who is three in one, distinct and different, yet unified, One God, only one God, no other gods before him. And this God who is Jehovah in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament, three but one. It's just, it's amazing and and it's beautiful. And then we see down in verse 26 of Genesis 1, it says, then God said, Hey, let's make man, he might not have said hey. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Elohim is the ruler. He says, let's make man in our likeness so that they may rule. Then verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then when he created people, there was this distinction. There was male and there was female. Now after Easter, we'll get into a series where we'll talk about that a little more. We're not going to talk about that a lot this morning, but you can't go to Genesis without seeing that. And today in our culture, we hear an awful lot about sex and gender. Sex not as an activity, but, uh, uh, but as an identity, as who we are, and, and gender. And our culture would say that those are different things. It doesn't matter your sex. You can choose your gender. But here's Man, this is, so, this is so good that the issue of sex and gender isn't something that is just random like a pinball that, you know, depends on what country you're in, what culture you're in, who's running the show. Is it the Gen Zs? Is it the Gen Xers? Is it the millennials? The boomers? The, the past the boomers? The builders? But, the, but that God actually talks about it. Now, here's what I want to say about it this morning. I'm not going to say a lot. You could look at, you, we could look at verse 27, and for those of us who know God 
have, know the scriptures, we can look at 27, good, that's good, good enough for us. That's good enough for us, that, that God created male and female, and how he created us should direct us, and that we shouldn't fight against how he's created us. But it would be doing a disservice to believers, to God, to the scriptures, to think that that's the only verse that teaches that. Because if you were to put gender glasses on, gender shades, that you're, you're thinking about gender now, you're taking into account in the back of your mind the culture that we live in, and then you start at Genesis 1, and then you start reading, you are gonna find a lot of scripture that speaks to gender and sex in the Bible. It's like saying, well, there's only, there's only two verses that actually prohibit, you know, throw, fill in the blanks. No, that's for the lazy person who wants to proof text something. No, the Bible is one long narrative, one long story of God saving mankind through the Messiah Jesus. And as you go through here, there are families and there are situations, there are events, there are betrayals and there are acts of faithfulness. There's obedience and disobedience. There's descriptions of, of tribes and countries and civilizations. Um, there's people's positions and, and all kinds of information. And so much of it, as you would go through it, and it'll take you a little while to read the whole Bible with your gender uh, shades on, but you'll find a lot. You'll have a holistic understanding, a biblical understanding, and it won't just rest on one or two verses. You'll see that, for instance, most of the people in here have a mom and a dad. That's significant. It's not just descriptive, but you see that it's prescriptive from the beginning of the Bible to the end. And what is so common, what is so common is that people, well, Satan and all of his cohort, and people will do all kinds of stuff to mess up God's plan. That's not unusual. So that's happening today, it's, not, it's nothing new. It's not unusual at all. It's gonna continue to happen until Jesus comes and is the king and all of his enemies are defeated, that will continue to happen. So we can't take our cue from the culture. We can't take our cue from the majority opinion. Really, we have to take our cue from God's word. And finally, I've said more than I wanted to, but finally, I would say that the Bible teaches us what, what God wants and what he expects, and then it teaches us how to live and how to treat each other. And the sad thing is when a church or a group, they get this part right, they got their truth right, but then they, they hold it in an uncivil way where they just kind of take it and they start smacking people with it because we, we have a, a younger generation today that have screens and everything that they watch and everything they listen to is gonna be opposite of this. And if we take a combative stance toward them, not even a, if in our hearts we don't love and care for every generation and we don't approach one another and others the way Paul and Peter and John and James teach us to in the New Testament, the way Jesus taught us to, we may win the battle, but we'll end up losing the war. But we're gonna talk about that after Easter. We're gonna talk about that more. Um, but, but God created male and female, and it's a very big topic. It's not a soundbite issue. It's very nuanced in on this side. It's not really that nuanced on this side, the truth side, but the situations that we get ourselves into with people, like 
Everything's great when you want to have a position on something. But then when you've got a person with a name and they're in front of you, <laughs> now, oh, oh, God called me to, to love this person and to share good news with them and to love even my enemies. If they're not probably even my enemy, but if he called me to love and care for my enemies, what is he calling me to do with this person or with this group of people? So that's, that's, so, that's so important. Now, um, I need a volunteer. In fact, put the requirements up. A volunteer who's smart, has a good sense of humor, humble though, but pleasant, but not overly confident. I need somebody who's cheerful, but thoughtful. Not too wordy, but still quite interesting. So I need a volunteer. Who, okay, all right, come on up. You're coming up. You raised your hand first, so you get to be part of the participation segment of the morning. I saw you earlier, by the way. Come here. Remind me of your name? Ethan. Ethan. Okay, are you ready? You think you can do this? I hope so. You hope so? Okay, you gotta hold the mic. Now, when you talk, you have to have it fairly close, so let's practice. Say good morning. Good morning, everyone. Okay, that, that, there we go. So, Ethan, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go out and from each of the four sections, I need you to get one interesting item. It can't be too big because you have to carry all four items back up to me. Okay? So you go to that section and you, you all have to help. Some, if, you've got, if you think you've got an interesting item, I want you to give it to them. So you have to bring four interesting items back up and they have to fit here on the table. Okay? Okay. You ready? Go. Okay, so help out Ethan. Hold up an interesting item. Okay, you just got to gather, gather four. Okay, you got one from that section. Okay, now this other section here. Oh. All right. Section number three. Oh, door to the front here, Ethan. Oh. All right. Now one more from that section. Oh, there we go. You got an easy one. You got an easy one. These might be more interesting than this morning, although this morning's are interesting. How many of you know Jim Cleary? Jim did this this morning, and it was like the Bob Barker of The Price is Right. He was, he was phenomenal. Okay, all right. Oh, you even put him in. Look at this. Okay, so we got this. We've got this. Ooh, oh. Let's see, we've got this. Do you know what this is? No. Okay, it's interesting then, isn't it? It just got given to me. Then we've got... I don't know what it is. Okay. Oh, so tempted with that one. All right. Okay, so, Ethan, what's this? A banana. Okay, all right. Is it interesting? Sort of. Oh, you got it. you're diplomatic. Okay. What's this, Ethan? Cell phone. Okay, what kind of a cell phone? Some type of iPhone. Yep, some type of iPhone. <laughs> you're right, it is some. There's a lot of different iPhones, okay? Yeah. You think that's interesting? A little bit. Ooh. Okay, all right. Now, this is going to be... I have no be, idea what that is. This is going to be the interesting thing. This is, this is, okay, so what is this? Somebody, was this from this section over here? An insulin pump. I thought it was something like that. So is there insulin in here? Do you like charge it up at night? Wow. Okay, well, that, that's real interesting. I, I have questions about that. And then what is this? A cowboy hat. Okay, what's the size? Uh, extra, extra, no, like extra, extra, extra large. Yeah, 3X, 3X. Okay, all right. So now, here, come here, come up, come up here with me. So now we've got some, uh, 
We've got, I've got some questions here for these. These are four interesting items. Okay, now, as we look at these, is there one, is, is, let's just say this one. Is it an uncaused random object of nature? In other words, if you went out in the field or the woods somewhere, would you just see one, one of these? No. How about this one, Ethan? No. You wouldn't see one of these if you were outside? I mean, not here, but. Oh, well, yeah. We're banana, like Panama or something. Okay, so, so this one would be. Okay, so we'll put that one right there. All right. Now, are these mass produced or one of a kind? Uh, are these, like, do they crank these out in a factory or do they are made one, one at a time? Uh, they crank them out. They crank them out? Yeah, they crank them out. They're mass produced, okay? So now, what's the purpose of this? Do you know what an insulin pump is? No. It's to deliver uh, medication into your body that you need. That's okay. weird. Yeah. Are you ready? No. Come here, Ethan. Oh, no. Back off. Okay. And then uh, the purpose of this is to... Talk. Yep. Talk. Actually, it isn't, but it kind of is. It's one of the purposes. Now, we don't really use phones to talk anymore, Ethan. All right, um, where were these manufactured? Were these things manufactured at somebody's home or someplace else? What do you think? Someplace else. Someplace else. Maybe like a factory? Yeah. How about this? That's the different thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So that maybe is more like us than these are, right? Because we were created... We can't make those. We can grow them, but we really can't mm -hmm. make them. We can't like have a banana factory unless you want plastic bananas, <laughs> right? Okay. I would hate plastic bananas. Now, how many steps did it take to bring this to the market? I have no idea. In other words, anybody got a guess? We didn't have anything like this in the first service. We had, a, we had actually a, an Apple tag so you could find your lost stuff. But how many steps from you conceive of the product until it's on the shelf and somebody's picking it up? Thousands, right? Thousands, five, yes. Five for this, maybe two, two. Me want hat, mm, hat, okay. All right, I'm teasing. Uh, thousands, right, thousands, pretty, pretty complex. And then the last question is, are any of these four items more complex than the human body? Probably. You think so? I don't know. The answer is no. Either. Okay, no. No, not at all. We are way more, like your brain is way more com. Your earlobe is probably more complex than any of these things, right? So I have a statement here on the next slide. There's not a thing in this room that was not intentionally designed and created for a purpose, and then marketed, sold, and distributed. So look around the room with me, right? We've got the lights, we've got sound panels on the back wall, there's a hoop with a net, chairs, people's clothing. There's really nothing in this room even our clothes, your boots, there's nothing in this room that somebody didn't design, manufacture, and then put up for sale somewhere, right? Right. Except for you. Nobody bought you off the shelf at Kmart or me, right? So God did that. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give, uh, I don't think I'm going to do that. We're going to go like this. We're going to set that there. I'm going to give these three things back to you, and you're going to put them on the communion table when you go down. And everybody give Ethan a hand for participating. Thank you, Ethan. Good job, man. Good job being the first one to raise your hand. So now I've got a few more questions for you. Are you an uncaused 
random act of nature. Now, you know, some of us were told by our parents that we were an oops, right? Maybe an uncaused, well, we would still be caused. We might be random, right, in that sense, but really, none of us is random. Because at some point, God decided to connect body and soul and put together this person. Number two, are you mass produced or one of a kind? How, would, how many would you, would you say that we're, we're mass produced? Okay, good. We're one of a kind, right? Because, I mean, let's see, who can we pick on in here, right? Uh, we'll, I will pick on Mike Sander. Hey, Mike. Hi, you were up here with me last week. There's one of a kind, right? There's only one Mike Sander, right? We'd like to have more, but there's only one Mike Sander to go around. And as you look up and down the row or across the room, there's really nobody else that looks like you. Like, not really at all. We're all extremely different, one of a kind. Number three, these things all have a purpose. What's your purpose? To eat, <laughs> to consume food, to sleep, to exercise. Like, what's your purpose? Why did God create you? Think about it. If people take all this time to put together a business plan and do all this testing and experimentation and research on whether or not a product is needed and will sell, and does all of these mock-ups of it and, and uh, sampling to try to figure out if some, do you think that God would just like, you would just drop off the conveyor belt while he was looking the other way and a few more go by and drop into the human's box and that you're just like, you're just random? Or did God maybe know who your ancestors were and what kind of DNA you would have and where you would live and what you would do and who you would serve and how you would help and how you could make a difference on the planet? Maybe. Where were you manufactured? Hmm. Well, we don't want to get into that too much, right? But here, what I would say there too, though, is physically, right, physiologically, we've got these flesh bodies, but there's a part of us that when the body dies, lives on, right? It's that part of us that gives light to our eyes and our, our voice and our personality, that when a body ceases to live, all of that is gone. The soul and the spirit, they're gone. If the body is complex, is the soul and spirit also complex? Is there a complexity and a sophistication and a value when you're talking about just the soul and spirit? I think probably unbelievably invaluable. Unbelievable complexity. That we could be made in his image. And are we still in his image even outside of our body? But a body's important, right? because at the resurrection, God's gonna be making new bodies. They're gonna be bodies, but they're gonna be spiritual bodies. Not dishonorable, but glorious, right? Not corruptible, but incorruptible. Not subject to decay, but eternal. Not just physical, but physical and spiritual. How many steps to bring you to the earth? Well, again, we can think of it just as a biological thing, or we can also think of it as, what was God's plan for your life? And how does he match soul and body? What kind of a body does this soul need? Subject to the limitations and the, the, the DNA, strengths and weaknesses, what kind of a body does this person need? And how does God match those up? And for what purpose? And then to quote Psalm 139, yes, 
We're fearfully and wonderfully made. That's a softball question. But number seven, the real question is, what are you going to do with you? If God created and he doesn't like just do these random, I'll oh, just churn out a dozen quick people. But there's actually thought and intention and design and care and love and relationship. Then what do we do with us? How do we respond to God? You're new in the sense that you, didn't, you weren't born last night and you didn't fall off the turnip truck, as they say, but you're new, you're different, you're unique, you're one of a kind, you're different than everybody else, and you're created for a purpose. I wanna show you, we looked at uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. If you back up two verses, you'll find this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 15. It says, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. You hear people talking about, hey, you gotta do your truth. You gotta live your truth. You gotta live for you. Whatever you're experiencing right now is 100% normal. Don't worry about it. Well, should no longer live for themselves, but for him. There's a hint as to what our purpose is. It's that we're to live for somebody other than ourselves, for the one actually who sacrificed himself for us, the one who died for us. We're to live for him. And the New Testament is just, it's just filled, filled with suggestions, directives, descriptions of what it must be like to live for Jesus. Jesus talks about it over and over through the Gospels. And then Paul and Peter and John and Mark, um, Jude and James, they, they all talk about how somebody lives for Jesus. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? In our culture, we're to live for ourselves. In our culture, it's all about me, baby. You go jump off a, the highest diving board somewhere, I'm gonna take care of me. That's the culture we live in. What makes me happy? What I decide for me, nobody can tell. Not even my parents can tell me. I'm gonna do what I wanna do. That is the quickest way to sadness, depression, suicidal thoughts, anxiety, uh, and every other bad thing you can throw in. I don't mean to just pick those four. It's the quickest way to a failed life. When we align ourselves with the one who created us and the one who gave his life for us, and we say, okay, I'm gonna live for him. That's the direction toward joy. That's the direction of, toward purpose, toward happiness, toward fulfillment, toward impact and influence and, and, and significance and legacy. That's the direction to, for those things. When we decide we're not gonna live for ourselves, we're gonna live for him. That's a very countercultural message. We're used to hearing it here in church. But once we walk out these doors, that's not what we hear on our iPhones or on our screens or our computers. So we're gonna be talking about purpose. We were created for a purpose. We're gonna be talking about being made new I, um, I told you this story before. Some of you probably weren't here when I told it, but when we first got married, my mother gave us this big behemoth of a microwave, and we had no room in our little small apartment on the countertops for this big microwave. It was extra long. And 
So I decided I was gonna build a microwave stand. And I, I, took, um, I took this assessment recently, and what it said, it's for, for your job. The suggestion for me, the way my results came out, was don't be responsible for maintaining equipment, and don't be responsible to build anything. That's exactly what it said. You're not wired to do that stuff, which thankfully I don't. But I built this microwave stand. And after wiring it to the wall so that it wouldn't fall over, we used it for about a year and then, then we moved and it was not worth taking with us. So I took it out the back door and we had a dumpster behind the apartment and I it was kind of like a little bit bulky and I didn't want to just throw this bulky thing. So I just kind of I just kind of threw it up in the air about three feet. And when it hit, it kind of hit at an angle and the whole thing just flattened right down to nothing. My wife and I stood there and laughed because it was so poorly, poorly made. It had to be buttressed to the wall so that it wouldn't fall over. And I think about that when I think about God's creation, God's design, how God made us. God didn't make us like I made that microwave stand. God makes us so that we're fit to accomplish the purpose he has for us. We're not gonna fall over, we're not gonna throw everything on the ground if we do what God has called us to do. He makes good stuff, he creates good stuff. We'll talk a lot more about that after Easter, but next week we'll continue this series called New, um, because God has made us, he has made us new from darkness to light, from death to life, from parked to purpose. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for making us, thank you for making us new originally and then for us being made new in Christ. Two very different things, Lord. And we're rejoicing that we can be new in Christ through faith in him. God, I pray that if there's any here this morning who have never placed their faith in Jesus, believed in the one who died on the cross to pay for our sins. God, that they would come to you, that they would admit and confess their sin to you and call out to you, Lord Jesus, that that sacrifice you made on the cross would be good for them, and it would be, and their sins would be forgiven, and they'd go from spiritual death to new spiritual life. God, work in our hearts so that we could follow you. And as we follow you into this week, Lord, help us to love and serve with confidence and in faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.